Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 14 from our series on the book of Ephesians is titled Ephesians in the Heart. It's ready for teaching on September 30. The author is John McVeigh and your reader is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 23. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we come towards the end of this beautiful book of Ephesians written by Paul so long ago, that we see in it your love and your grace exhibited not just to the people who thought they should be able to follow you, but those that you wanted to follow you. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit, who worked on their lives and worked on Paul in writing this book, may also work in our lives as well. May we understand more your love, your grace and your care for us. And as we prepare for the day when Jesus does return, we pray that in that intervening time we may show his grace to those around us. And today I'd like to pray for people who are listening, and some of them I don't know where they're from, but I'd like to pray for Joan Philip Gregory and Hazelyn Balliston and Lydia LaFortune and Doreen Hines, who I know listens regularly, and Esmalyn Bryan, and someone whose nickname is I'm Smiling on the Inside. I love that. And Vincent Dederer, uh, who's visually impaired in Reading in California. Welcome, Vincent, and I hope that these lessons are a blessing to you. And Young Audacity, and the Minstrel 55, who just loves the music that we have on the uh, lesson here. And for Jatin Sharma from Nepal, and Jatin, I think you're the first person to respond from Nepal, and may God bless you, and may you be able to share with those around you, and Chris H. Lord, we just thank you that so many people just love to hear your word, and as I read these lessons, Lord, I pray that they may be a blessing, and that not only will people enjoy them, but lives will be changed, and that each of us will walk closer to Jesus each day of our lives. I pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Now, memory text this week is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's read that again, Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them in them. Visitors to London climb on board the London Eye, a Ferris wheel-like attraction. From 450 feet above the River Thames, you can see it all. Big Ben, the Houses of Parliament, and many historic palaces and cathedrals. For New Testament scholar Nicholas Thomas, or Tom, Wright, The letters to the Ephesians, he writes, stands in relation to the rest of Paul's letters, rather like the London Eye. It isn't the longest or fullest of his writings, but it offers a breathtaking view of the entire landscape. From here, as the wheel turns, you get a bird's eye view of one theme after another. And that's from Paul for Everyone, The Prison Letters, published by the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge, publishing in 2004, and that was from page 3. In Ephesians, Paul is not focused on issues of local concern. The letter reads as though Paul were addressing believers everywhere and Christian churches wherever they exist. The letter's timeless feel allows the breathtaking view Paul offers to invade our own world and thought. As we review each chapter, let's keep this question in mind. What important truths embedded in Ephesians should continue to shape our lives as believers? Sunday, September 24. 
We are blessed in Christ. Someone has described Ephesians as the Alps of the New Testament. Paul, our mountaineering guide, takes us on a rapid ascent in Ephesians chapter 1. We are quickly breathless and amazed at the view from the summit. Reflect on Ephesians chapter 1, what especially inspires you, what peaks do you see? Well, let's read the whole chapter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him." In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we, who first trusted in Christ, should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of his glory. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened." that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 to 14 functions like a map of a mountain summit that identifies the peaks on the horizon, as Paul orients us to our beloved place in the vast landscape of the plan of salvation. The scenery covers the full span of salvation history from eternity past, through God's grace-filled actions in Christ, to eternity future. God's redemption of believers reflects divine initiatives taken before the foundation of the world, it said in verse 4, which are now being worked out in our lives, as we read in verse 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And in verses 13 and 14, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. These pre-creation strategies will be fully accomplished at the end of time, we read in verses 9 and 10. Then all things both in heaven and on earth will be gathered together or united in Christ, and God's plan for the fullness of time will be fulfilled, as you read in verse 
verse 10. Then we will experience fully God's mysterious plan of verse 9. In the present, we may be certain that Christ's centred salvation in which we stand is an important part of God's wide-reaching plan for the redemption of all things. Being on a mountaintop inspires thanksgiving. In Ephesians 1, 15-19, Paul gives thanks to God as he prays that believers may experience the salvation God has planned for them. We find ourselves on another steep climb as he points us upward to the risen, ascended, exalted Christ, who rules over every imaginable power for all time. In verses 20 to 23, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Through the grace of God expressed in Christ Jesus, we may live this day on the mountaintop. Ephesians 1, 4 tells us that Christ chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Think about what that means. Chosen in him before the world existed. What great hope should this offer you in regard to God's desire for you to be saved? Monday, September 25. We are redeemed for community. As you read Ephesians chapter 2, seek to answer the following question. What has God done for us through his Son, Jesus Christ? Well, let's read Ephesians chapter 2. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves." It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. 
But God, these two words must be the most hope-filled ones known to humankind. In Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 10, Paul describes the grim past of his audience, sharing the plight of all humanity they were bent upon rebellion against God, their lives dominated by sin and Satan, as you read in verses 1 to 3. But God, who is rich in mercy, and what did God do for them and for us? 1. He made us alive with Christ. Christ's resurrection is our own. 2. He raised us up with Christ. Christ's ascension is our own. 3. In heaven he seated us with Christ. Christ's coronation is our own, as you read in Ephesians 2, 4-7. We are not just bystanders to the cosmos-shifting events of Christ's life. God takes these remarkable actions not because of any merit in us, but because of his grace, as we read in verses 8 and 9. And he intends believers to live in solidarity with Jesus and practice good works, in verse 10. If Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10, teaches that we live in solidarity with Jesus, Ephesians 2, 11 to 20, teaches that we live in solidarity with others as part of his church. Jesus' death has both vertical benefits, establishing the believer's relationship with God in verses 1 to 10, and horizontal ones, cementing our relationships with others in verses 11 to 22. Through his cross, Jesus demolishes all that divides Gentile believers from Jewish ones, including the misuse of the law to widen the gulf in verses 11 to 18. Jesus also builds something, an amazing new temple composed of believers. Gentiles, once excluded from worship in sacred places of the temple, now join Jewish believers in becoming one. We too become part of God's church, a holy temple in the Lord, as we read in verses 19 to 22. Through the grace of God, you have the privilege of living this day in solidarity with Jesus and your fellow believers. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 has played a role in the conversion of many. Martin Luther found in these verses a grace that won his heart, and he discovered as well some central affirmations of the Reformation. Salvation comes by faith alone, through grace alone, by Christ alone, and to the glory of God alone. Let's read that again. Salvation comes by faith alone, through grace alone, by Christ alone, and to the glory of God alone. In 1738, 18 days after experiencing conversion in London's Aldersgate Street, John Wesley preached at Oxford University offering a cry from the heart and the manifesto of a new movement. His texts, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Tuesday, September 26, we are the Church of the Living God. Why is it both important and exciting to be part of God's Church? Well, let's have a look at Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll begin at verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now... 
the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purposes which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. We are encouraged when we hear church members say positive things about the church. However, the most enthusiastic among us falls short of Paul's exuberant testimony in Ephesians 3 about the church. Paul starts a report of his prayers for believers in Ephesus in verse 1. And he goes through too in verses 15 to 23, but breaks off to discuss God's creation of the church in verses 2 to 13, and then completes his prayer report in verses 14 to 21. Along the way, he comes to understand important things about God's plan or mystery. In eternity, God conceives of the mystery or the plan about the church. We read about that in verses 3 to 5 and 9 and 11. Through the life and death of Jesus, that long hidden plan is accomplished, as it says in verse 11, and was also spoken about in the previous chapter, verses 11 to 22. By revelation, Paul learns the mystery of the church and the astonishing fact that Gentiles are to be full partners in it in verses 3 to 6. Paul participates in spreading this good news as preacher to the Gentiles of the unsearchable riches of Christ, as he expresses in verses 8 and 9. With many one to Christ, the church, composed as it is of both Jews and Gentiles, displays the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, in verse 10, announcing their coming doom, as we find in chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. The plan to unite all things in Christ, in Ephesians 1.10, is underway, and their time is short. This understanding of the church motivates Paul to pray for believers. Why not imagine him praying the heartfelt prayer of Ephesians three fourteen to 20 about you? Why not imagine him praying that you will be filled with all the fullness of God, as it says in verse 19, and participate fully in the amazing unfolding mystery of a unified church? And so to finish the day... What are the kinds of barriers between believers in our church that, in light of what Paul has written, should not be there? What can you do to help remove them? Wednesday, September 27, The Unity of Faith in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul asks believers to stop doing some things and to be sure to do others. What are those things? Well, let's read chapter 4. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. 
Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man who was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labour, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4 begins and ends with calls to care for each other as church members in verses 1 to 3 and verse 32. Between these invitations, Paul offers strong support for the idea that we should nourish unity in the church. He begins by listing seven ones. There is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, Jesus Christ, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, in verses 4 to 6. We are bound together by these spiritual realities. We are, in fact, united. While unity is a theological certainty, it requires our hard work. So we should always be endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit, as it says in verse 3. One way each of us may do so is by being an active part of the body of Christ, as we're encouraged in verses 7 to 16. Every member is a gifted part of the body and should contribute to the health of it. We read in verse 7 and in verse 16, And all should benefit by the work of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. We read in 11 and 12. These, like ligaments and tendons, have a unifying function, helping us grow up together into Christ, who is the head of the body, verses 13 and 15. At the time, Paul also told them that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, in verse 14. Words that clearly suggest that the early church faced some internal struggles from the trickery of men. 
As Paul moves towards his final appeal, to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, in verse 32, he asks believers to avoid their former hard-heartedness, in verses 17 to 24, and to avoid anger and harsh speech, substituting instead language that builds up and imparts grace, in the final six verses. This chapter on unity is easy enough to read when things are peaceful. It is more challenging and important to read it when we become embroiled in some conflict. Are you remembering today to experience the unity of the body of Christ, the unity for which he died? And so to finish the day, what are ways that we can contribute to the unity of our church, both at the local and worldwide levels? Why is it important that we do what we can? Thursday, September 28, we are recipients and givers of grace. As you read Ephesians 5, reflect on how Paul asks us to live out the gospel in our relationships with others. Which of his exhortations is especially meaningful to you? Well, let's read Ephesians chapter 5, but we'll start actually at the end of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks." For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord." Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed and made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light, therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water, by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones." For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. 
Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. If you start reading Ephesians 5 at its beginning, you may miss the full power of an important theme. So, start instead with Ephesians 4.32, in which Paul tells the Ephesians to be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. As believers, we are called to model our behaviour toward others on God's forgiveness and grace toward us. We are to imitate God. Actually, we're going to read here Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Paul contrasts this imitating the love of God lifestyle with the usual pagan approach. Instead of treasuring others as brothers or sisters in the family of God, humans all too often use others for their own sexual pleasure and then brag about it, as we read in verses 3 and 4 of Ephesians 5. He warns that such an approach has no future in the new world God is planning in verses 5 to 7. Instead, believers are to turn from the darkness of their past and walk as children of light in verses 8 to 10 mimicking the Father's love. Again, Paul warns us away from works of darkness done in secret in verses 11 and 12. By contrast, we are to live in the light of Christ in verses 13 and 14. Rather than wasting our lives in drunkenness, we will be redeeming the time by offering thanks to God for His love in verses 15 to 21. Paul extends his theme of imitating God's love as he advises Christian husbands and wives. Christ's self-sacrificing love for the church becomes the model for Christian husbands in verses 25 to 33, while the loyalty of the church toward Christ becomes the model for Christian wives in verses 22 to 24. Rather than using the gift of human sexuality in a debauched and selfish way, a Christian husband and wife focus on valuing and treasuring each other, becoming one flesh in verses 28 to 33. Be imitators of God as dear children, we read at the beginning in verse 1. By God's grace, you are called today to live out that exhortation in your relationships with others. And so to finish today, how does Ephesians 5.2, which tells us to walk in love, help us understand what Paul means in Ephesians 5.1 about being imitators of God? So we'll read those two verses to finish today. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Friday, September 29. We conclude by reflecting on Ephesians chapter 6, where we discover that we, the church, are the peace-waging army of God. Chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, 
Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleases, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters, do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak but that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. In Ephesians, Paul has portrayed the church as the body of Christ in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, and chapter 4, verses 11 to 16, as God's temple in chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, and as the bride or wife of Christ in chapter 5, verses 21 to 33. In Ephesians six ten to 20 Paul describes the church as God's army and offers a vigorous call to arms. It is a passage that offers much benefit and risks misunderstanding. We could misunderstand Paul's words as a call to take up military weapons or to be combative in our relationships with others. Paul, though, has been emphasising unity, edifying speech and tender-heartedness. We're going to look at Ephesians 4, 25, verses 5 to 2. And that reads, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labour, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. He describes God's good news as the gospel of peace in chapter 6, verse 15. Through this vivid military metaphor, the church is not exhorted to wage war in the traditional sense. 
Rather, we are to wage peace in the spiritual battle against evil. Paul steps onto the battlefield of the great controversy and calls us to enlist in God's army. We should do so with a realistic assessment of the enemy in view, since it will never do to underestimate the forces arrayed against us. We don't confront just human enemies, but spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, we read in verse 12, led by a wily general, the devil, we read in verse 11. However, we need not be daunted by our enemies. God is present with us in the battle, in verse 10, and has supplied us with the finest of weaponry, his own armour, the armour of God in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. And we're going to compare that now with Isaiah chapter 59 and verses 15 to 17. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. He has placed at our disposal truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation and the Spirit, as we read in verses 13 to 17. With God going before us and our being equipped from head to toe in the armour he has supplied, we cannot fail. Victory is assured. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, though we are not saved by our works, what does Paul mean when he writes that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, in chapter 2, verse 10? What then is the purpose of our good works? And two, Paul writes... In chapter 3, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, what power works in us, and how should this power be made manifest in our lives? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Praising God for Epilepsy by Andrew McChesney Anna Rosenberger has struggled with epilepsy since she was a child in Riga, Latvia. It wasn't only about seizures. Epilepsy affected her emotions and brain functions. It was hard for her to focus and she longed to be healed. The summer after she graduated from high school, the 19-year-old teen went to a psychic who claimed she could heal her. When the psychic saw she could not help, she told Anna about another client who found healing through a pastor's prayer. The psychic gave Anna the pastor's phone number. He will tell you a lot about his church and God, but don't listen to him, she said. Just take the healing and leave. The rest of what he says is a lie. Anna called the pastor. In their phone conversation, she heard for the first time about the Seventh-day Adventist church. They agreed to meet. At their second meeting, the pastor prayed for Anna, but the epilepsy remained. Anna liked the pastor and accepted an invitation to attend Bible studies. Later that summer, she attended a small group meeting at the church. Then she went to a Sabbath worship service. You know what, she told her mother afterward, I think the church is good. So Anna's mother went with her to church. A few months later, Anna was attending church with both her mother and father. The next summer, Anna and her mother were baptised. A year later, her father was baptised. Then her grandmother and brother were baptised. Over the years, many people have prayed for Anna. She has been anointed with oil, but the epilepsy has remained. Anna wondered why God had not healed her, but then it struck her. Like to the Apostle Paul, who also prayed for relief, God was saying to her, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
in 2 Corinthians 12.9 in the New King James Version. Now Anna 30 sees epilepsy as a blessing. Since it is an illness she must deal with every day, she has learned she needs to trust God even more. Some Sabbath mornings she feels like staying in bed, but then she remembers she is scheduled to participate in church. So she goes to church and trusts that God will pull her through. Epilepsy also has helped her witness. The challenge has given her empathy for others. She doesn't always mention her epilepsy when she first meets people, but she has found that being vulnerable about herself helps others open up and listen. So my epilepsy has helped me spread the word, Anna says. I am thankful for the challenges with my health. This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will go to two projects in the Trans-European Division, including one in Latvia. Thank you for planning a generous offering this Sabbath. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Kurumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as eyes for the visually impaired through Christian services for the blind in Australia and New Zealand, it became a podcast in July 2007 and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in a YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, remember, God is always faithful.